Good day, everyone. I hope you're having a great day. I'm Kelly. I'm, I'm an open source Bitcoin developer. I've been working on Lightning for years. Today, I work on Cashew and BitChat. That's what I want to talk about today. So first, show of hands. Who knows Cashew? Who's heard of Cashew before? Bunch of hands. BitChat. Who knows what BitChat is? More hands. Nice. OK. So first of all, while I talk, scan this QR code. I want you to install this app during this, during this talk. It's going to be fun. I'll wait 10 more seconds. That's it. Bitcoin was first introduced in 2008 by Satoshi Nakamoto as a response to the financial crisis, which is evident by the inscription that Satoshi left in the first Genesis block, Chancellor on brink of second bailout. There was another response to the financial crisis back then. In 2011, the Occupy Wall Street movement brought thousands of people onto the streets of New York. These protesters were demonstrating against the government bailing out the big banks with the money of the taxpayer. What followed was a crackdown of the state against the protest. And especially one of the things that the state has done there was to take away the protesters' ability to communicate during their, um, during their assemblies. They took away their rights to use microphones and megaphones during the protest. And that's where the protesters came up with a very finicky and interesting idea. They invented the so-called human microphone. The idea is simple. There's one person who wants to give a talk, and there are many people listening on a square. How do you reach everyone if you don't have a microphone? And that's where the human microphone steps in. The person giving the talk would speak one sentence at a time. The people around that person would pick up that sentence and amplify it by speaking it again. And then that would propagate slowly until everyone has heard the message on the square. What became apparent is that Occupy Wall Street is a as a social movement needs resilient forms of communication. And with the proliferation of the internet, digital communication has been ever more important for social movements. And this became clear in 2011. What was deemed to be the first digital revolution, the Arab Spring, particularly in Egypt, showed the importance of protecting communication infrastructure for bottom-up movements. During their peaceful protest for fight for democracy, it was crucial that protesters could communicate in the digital space. Some have called it the Facebook revolution. Activists organized via Facebook and Twitter and used hashtags to find each other. But the dictatorship found a way to silence millions by cutting off the internet and without having to arrest them and put them into jail. Communication on the internet is almost always intermediated. In Egypt, the internet shutdown lasted for five whole days. And the crackdown on the internet infrastructure demonstrated the vulnerability of centralized communication systems. But humans have to communicate. And when communication flows through centralized systems, those systems have centralized choke points that can be abused, abused by dictators and tyrants. So how did the Egyptian people respond? They used old school methods like pamphlets because the government did not or could not shut down the telephone system. They relied on fax machines, uh, phone trees, and they used international phone calls to reach the internet using dial-up modems in other countries. So the internet can be very powerful for movements, but it comes with a risk. It comes with the risk of being shut down and with the risk of being surveilled. In 2014, the Umbrella Movement in Hong Kong faced the threat of digital surveillance and artificial network obstructions. But for the first time, protesters could reach to a decentralized communication app called FireChat. FireChat is a Bluetooth peer-to-peer -peer mesh network communication app. And at its peak, FireChat has seen hundreds of thousands of downloads in Hong Kong. And it became the first major example in the world where mesh networking was used in a mass protest. And for the first time, the physical infrastructure that is used by a movement for communication was owned by the demonstrators themselves. So these movements show us centralized communication is a choke point and produces single points of failure. And we can only speak freely as long as the gatekeepers allow it. The struggle for free communication, however, is not only limited to authoritarian regimes where people fight for democracy. 
When communication relies on centralized systems, freedom of speech is conditional and restricted. Centralization, whether through states or through mega cooperation, can be abused and surveillance, for surveillance and for control. And our democratic principles require freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and the ability to communicate privately. So the Orwellian system that we have built today encourages complete total mass surveillance and recent pushes in Europe for anti-hate speech laws, age verification laws, and chat control hollow out the fundamentals of our democracy. These rules do not restrict only our ability to communicate, they also restrict our ability to think. They normalize total control. Of course, there will be bad people who misuse freedom of speech for, to commit crime. Their behavior should not be tolerated, and we cannot ignore the fact that we need to do something about that. But the answer cannot be to build centralized systems where a single entity controls what can be said and what not. We... Exactly. We cannot build the foundations of our civilizations built on systems with a single choke point. On the opposite, we do not tolerate mass surveillance for law-abiding citizens and for the sake of total control. We will not let it happen. There is too much on the line. Instead, access control and control mod control, uh, content moderation should be in the hands of the communities that actually use these systems. These are the European ideals expressed in digital space. These are the, I the ideals are not to give power to a central body to control everything, but to empower the each individual community to govern themselves in self-sovereignty. So as a complete violation of these ideals, the Snowden leaks have revealed that the NSA monitors all and every communication happening on the internet, even encrypted communication for potential decryption later. So the US and the five I countries have created a global surveillance system that was revealed by Snowden and it still exists today. But private communication is free communication. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that as humans, we have the right to self-determination and our democracies depend on our right to privacy. This is why we must fight chat control in Europe today. The lesson is we need to defend our right for privacy ourselves. As the famous quote by Eric Hughes from the Cypherpunk Manifesto goes, we cannot depend, expect governments or corporations to grant us privacy through their own beneficence. So a number of existing technologies try to solve this problem altogether by avoiding centralized communication. So we've already mentioned FireChat that was used in Hong Kong. But what you see here are mesh testic devices that use long-range radio, radio technology to communicate with each other. But these alternatives often have a downside. They may require specialized hardware, as you see here, and they are hard to use. So they rather appear to nerdy people instead of being accessible to everyone. Therefore, they have seen only limited adoption. You should not need a PhD in order to be able to use a mesh network. It should be as simple as using WhatsApp or Signal. Freedom of communication cannot be reserved for the experts or those who are priv privileged enough to have specialized hardware. Another big downside of these devices is that they look very suspicious. So imagine crossing a border with hundreds of mesh testic devices in your pocket in 2011 in Egypt. What would happen to you, do you think? You would probably be arrested, maybe you'd be tortured, maybe even killed. And there are borders in this world that don't allow the flow of any advanced technology altogether. For example, the Israeli occupation of Gaza right now doesn't permit the importing of any basic electronics. In their war against the Palestinian people, they made it absolutely impossible to import reliable communication infrastructure. So the, the, real, the importance of infrastructure for basic human rights and human flourishing cannot be understated cannot be overstated, excuse me. It's not even possible to bring a toaster to Gaza. Imagine bringing mesh-tastic devices. However, there is one type of device that can travel through all borders without raising suspicion. And it has to be something that is in everyone's hands. And maybe it's in your hand right now, or maybe in your pocket. 
And this type of device can run any type of software. And as we all know, software is borderless. There's 7.3 billion mobile phones, smartphones on the world right now. 86% of all people own a smartphone. It's practically impossible to confiscate all smartphones in the world. And remember Egypt. The regime did not turn off the phone system either. They cannot turn off a system they themselves rely on. And that's where BitChat steps in. So BitChat is a chat app that is a tool for communication. It's software, and it's a protocol, and it runs on every smartphone. And most importantly, BitChat cannot be turned off. It requires no internet connection, and like FireChat, it uses Bluetooth to send messages between the devices directly. There are no servers, and messages travel peer-to-peer -peer from one phone to another. Like the human microphone, messages are amplified within the crowd. There is no registration, no identity, no account. You download it, you install it, that's it. You can use it. It is pure permissionless communication. And I recommend you download it right now, and you can use it to also discuss this talk with others after. It's perfect for a conference like this. In recent months, we've seen spikes of downloads of BitChat linked to civil unrest around the world. It has started with Nepal. Early September this year, the Nepalese government decided to ban all social media platforms. This was a particularly bad idea in a country where the uh, median age is 25 years old. Protesters have reportedly elected their representatives in Discord chats. And many have downloaded BitChat to have decentralized communication tools at their hand in case of further government crackdowns. And this has been a repeated pattern. We've seen the same thing happen in Nepal, Indonesia, Madagascar, and Cote d'Ivoire. Whenever we observed a sudden spike of downloads in BitChat, a quick Google search revealed that there is currently a social uprising happening in that country. And we didn't advertise BitChat as a tool for demonstrations or civil unrest. People found it themselves. And as long as people will be oppressed by their governments, BitChat will be in demand. So imagine, imagine a solar storm hits the northern hemisphere and interrupts all our communication networks. The internet is shut down, your phone can't reach anyone, your Apple Pay doesn't work, you can't get any news. And you don't know what the situation is, and the worst, you can't reach your loved ones. How do you reach them to ask them if they're okay? How do you find the nearest location for help? Unfortunately, this is not an artificial scenario, and due to a natural disaster this year, this was the situation in Jamaica. Just before Hurricane Melissa hit Jamaica, we've seen a big spike in downloads for BitChat. Then the electricity and infrastructure was down. During that period, BitChat jumped to number two downloads of all apps in the Jamaican app stores, only surpassed by an app that helps to monitor the weather situation. So whether it's a natural disaster or a technical failure, our communication infrastructure is fragile. And as Bitcoiners, we don't only care about our communication infrastructure, we also care about our money and payment infrastructure. Not only because we say that money is also speech, we also say money is half of every transaction. So what happens when our money networks are turned off? We could just witness this this year in a nationwide power outage in Spain and Portugal. People were forced to reach back to the most resilient payment method that we know, one that has been around for centuries, good old physical cash. And in times of crises, a bare asset that can be handed from one person to another is king. Cash does not only work offline, it's also untraceable. 
And that's a killer feature of cash for democracy and freedom. Remember the umbrella movement in Hong Kong. The people in Hong Kong made a virtue out of a necessity. They quickly established a culture of using cash to buy their train tickets when they wanted to reach the demonstrations. They knew that the government can track every single transaction if they use credit cards for it, especially when the transaction is tied to your location when you want to take a train. So we asked, what if we could send Bitcoin from one person to another without being tracked? And what if we can even send it when the internet is down? What you see here are two devices both running BitChat. On the left, there is an Android. On the right is an iOS. This is a demo. We didn't release this yet. This is still under development. But what you can observe here is that the phone on the left sends Bitcoin to the phone on the right using Bluetooth. And it does this using a technology called Chomian eCash, using the Cashew protocol, a bearer asset representing Satoshis. And the whole process is instant and practically free. Only one of the only one of the two devices needs to be online to do this, and sometimes it also works fully offline. The Cash Protocol is our attempt to rebuild a better financial system from the ground up on top of Bitcoin. And for this, we're using the earliest form of digital cash called Chomian eCash. So Cash is a bearer asset that is issued by a financial entity called a mint. Think of a mint like a bank that has an ATM where you can withdraw physical paper bills, but instead of withdrawing physical paper bills, you withdraw digital cash. That is eCash. eCash is a piece of data that is stored on your device, and it's not like a bank account. It's more like physical cash, but in digital. So when you send eCash from one person to another, you literally send the data from your phone to their phone. The Cash Protocol has seen wide adoption in the Bitcoin ecosystem with a lot of interest from developers. And we are rebuilding the financial system that respects human rights and preserves user privacy and protects activists. All this while providing incredible transaction speeds, the best user experience that still works one of the two parties when one of the two parties is offline. Hell yeah. You can check out more on Cashew.space if you like. So with Cashew, we will be able to bring Bitcoin not only to the mesh, but also to small community banks, to large financial institutions, to social media platforms, and so much more. And it's already happening. Ecash scales to billions, all while preserving user privacy and, an incre and enabling incredible user UX. Yes, it comes at a cost that the users need to put some level of trust into the mint. But the utility of eCash is, not, is to be a payment technology and not a savings technology. It is a technology that is built on Bitcoin as hard money, but enables amazing user experience and privacy. We love magic internet money and we want it to be everywhere. We believe that the internet needs to be rebuilt from a different set of priorities. One that puts the user into control instead of large centralized choke points. One that preserves human rights and empowers people all over the globe. One that protects activists and freedom fighters. A system to leapfrog the old one. A system we can march into the future together. A system that still works when everything else fails. Thank you very much.